Jackson, how are you doing? I'm going to go ahead and bring this up so I can verify what signal's like and uh, check your questions if you're coming up with them. I'm going to have to apologize for some of the sound you're going to be hearing uh, over the course of things today. There's a big storm moving through Fort Smith right now, and so you might hear it sound at points like the uh, roof's about ready to blow off. But uh, we're going to make sure that we stay safe here. I hope everybody has been staying safe at home and taking care of what you need to take care of. Um, especially today is a special day uh, for us uh, being the uh, Peace Officers Memorial Day. Uh, there's a lot that uh, we think about, especially since one of the big reasons we are here in Fort Smith is simply the uh, Hall of Honor and our ability to recognize those individuals who have given their lives in the line of duty. Just go ahead and make sure that, that comes up. As always, Casey's on the computer on the, in the other room. She's going to be dropping some messages as we go. And so otherwise, uh, if you guys have, if anybody has any questions at any time as we're going through this, please feel free to let me know. I am more than happy to try to answer your questions. Uh, I have a very specific list of objects I want to uh, present today in light of today being the uh, Peace Officers Memorial Day. Uh, one of the things that I would really hope that you get a chance to do at some point is go take a look at our YouTube channel. We uh, were able to talk to a few folks uh, associated with the Marshals Service uh, who uh, were very kind and were able to uh, allow us to share their messages and their thoughts regarding Peace Officers Memorial Day. Um, everybody from, we've got a uh, current director of the Marshals Service, a couple of former director, act, director of acting directors of the Marshals Service, we have uh, several, uh, several of them were deputies, uh, several people were U.S. Marshals. Uh, we have our Fort Smith Mayor, George McGill, who's been very helpful to us here in Fort Smith to help share the message and help get our mission accomplished. So uh, hopefully if you get a chance, take a look. Um, Casey will be dropping the link. Uh, she, already sees, she already dropped the link and uh, just wanted to get the chance to uh, talk uh, just get a chance to watch that um, and kind of keep today in everybody's, everybody's thoughts. Uh, as a couple of people in the videos mentioned, today is not just about those people who gave their lives. It's also about their families. Uh, everybody, and the people I'm going to be talking about today, they all left loved ones. And so it's a special thing to think about. And uh, we're very much wanting to... Uh, help share this message as part of our mission to recognize the Marshal Service, but not just the Marshal Service, but law enforcement in general. Uh, so with that, I'm going to start talking, I'm going to get the gloves on. Uh, I'm going to be talking today specifically towards the whole idea of the uh, Peace Officers Memorial Day. And it's, it's a day that's been around uh, since the 60s. It was signed into law by President Kennedy. No relation. Uh, signed into law by President Kennedy. And it's been celebrated every year on May 15th. And so uh, today in Washington, D.C., uh, they're recognizing it, although a little bit differently than usual just because it's COVID-19. Uh, but if you get a chance to get to D.C., oh, yes, Mrs. Hudson Filler. Okay, I see you just dropped in. Uh, my thoughts are going out to you and your family today. Um, in D.C. today, they have the, uh, well, they're recognizing it, but if you ever get a chance to go to the National Law Enforcement Officers Memorial that's in D.C., uh, go and take a look. Uh, there, it's, it's really quite, quite an impressive uh, memorial, and it, I, I wish more people had a chance to go see it. Uh, it's a very special thing, very special place. Um, for those who don't know, uh, Mrs. Hudson Feller, who just dropped into the chat, her uh, one of her two sons is a deputy U.S. Marshal killed in the line of duty. Uh, her other son is 
uh, I believe still a deputy U.S. Marshal. Um, uh, but we are, and they were both at the dedication, well, the groundbreaking that was held here in Fort Smith, uh, most of uh, about six, seven years ago, I believe it was. Uh, it was before I arrived here. Uh, I'm going to go and, yep, Derek Haas and Pillar. That's, I could not remember his name. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start through. I have a selection of individuals from throughout the history of the March of the Service. Uh, and I'm going to talk just a little bit about each of them and materials that we have related to those individuals. Uh, and I'm going to read, in most cases, I'm going to read a short piece that kind of talks about their, about these individuals in their lives. Uh, a couple of these pieces you've already seen before. Uh, there's a couple of, actually, yeah, a couple of these pieces I think you've seen before. A couple of these pieces uh, are going to be brand new to you. Uh, the first one I want to show is, when, I think, the oldest piece in our collection. And there'll be photographs of all of these materials later on. Uh, I'll try and get pictures of them all and post them in the comments on this uh, video. Uh, this was a Peel portrait of uh, Robert Forsyth, the uh, first U.S. Marshal for the District of Georgia. And he was killed in the line of duty. He was the first Marshal Service person killed, well, first person killed in the line of duty to the Marshal Service. He also was only one of nine U.S. Marshals uh, to have been killed in the line of duty. Uh, most of the people killed in the line of duty were either deputy U.S. Marshals, posse members, special deputy U.S. Marshals. Uh, and so just really quickly as an overview, uh, Robert Forsyth was appointed U.S. Marshal of Georgia by President George Washington in 1789, reappointed four years later. Accompanied by two deputy U.S. Marshals, Forsyth went to the boarding house of Mrs. Dixon to serve brothers Beverly and William Allen with papers related to a civil court case. When Mrs. Dixon let the officers inside, the Allen brothers ran upstairs. Forsyth and the other officers followed, knocked on the door. When Forsyth started to open the door, Beverly Allen fired a shot that struck Forsyth in the head, killing him. U.S. Marshal Robert Forsyth was the first member of the United States Marshal Service to be killed in the line of duty. And so that was simply one, one of the requirements and one of the uh, what still to this day is the responsibility of the Marshal Service, and that is to uh, essentially deliver court papers, just process serve, uh, just be a process server, essentially. Uh, they showed up with a notice to appear. It wasn't a warrant. They weren't taking them into custody. They weren't doing anything along those lines. And yet uh, the person who was being presented with papers uh, chose at that point to uh, end the life of Marshal Forsyth. Uh, there's uh, some special stories about the Forsyth family, uh, and it was through the Forsyth family, eventually to the Marshal Service, that that miniature portrait arrived here. Um, the newest, here we've gone from the oldest thing in the collection to the newest uh, piece that we've received here in the collection. We received this Literally, it's this morning. Uh, this showed up in the mail. Uh, this is regarding this, our newest badge, Artist Chitty. I want to take a good picture of this, and I'll take a better picture of the back side. Uh, you probably won't be able to pick it up on the camera, but on the back side are the names of all of his deputies. This particular badge uh, was first about Artist Chitty. Uh, was appointed to the, be the United States Marshal for the Western District of Washington on March 20th, 1934. On the morning of August 22nd, 1940, Joseph Paul Kretzer and Arnold T. Kyle were facing escape charges stemming from an incident on April 11th, 1940. During the noon break of the proceedings, the prisoners were placed into a holding cell in the Marshal's office in Tacoma. When it was time to resume court, the two prisoners struck Chitty as he was attempting to escort them back to the courtroom. Chitty and the other officers were able to subdue the prisoners and put them back into the cell, but Chitty then slumped to the floor holding his chest. Doctors were unable to revive the marshal. He died of what would later be determined to be a massive heart attack. Kretzer and Kyle later pled guilty to second-degree murder in the death of marshal, marshal artist Chitty, and eventually both died in prison on Alcatraz Island. Uh, so he was about 60 years old at the time of his death, and he was one of only one of nine uh, U.S. Marshals to have been killed in the line of duty. Uh, specifically, uh, the way that this arrived to uh, here at the Marshals Museum was through his uh, grandson. 
uh, his grandson uh, was able to tell us more about the story. This particular badge was given to uh, artist Chitty for Christmas in 1934 by his 15 deputies. The names are all listed on the back of the badge. And uh, that was uh, six years before he was attacked and killed by the prisoners. Uh, it's believed at the time that, uh, that what had happened is one of the prisoners had struck Chitty with the handcuffs that he was wearing. So he had the, the essentially the bracelets and as he hit him with both of his fists together, he struck him with the handcuffs, and that led to what later happened. That was one of the ways that it's possible to happen. Uh, by one story, uh, it was this particular attack which led to the behavior of law enforcement to, in many cases, to use ankle and wrist cuffs that were connected by a chain so they couldn't lift their uh, arms up. Uh, but apparently he'd served in World War I as an officer in the U.S. Army Tank Corps under a young George Patton. Uh, then he returned to Washington State, was the editor of the newspaper at Shelton, Washington, and in 1934 was appointed U.S. Marshal. So that's a very special piece, and we were very excited. Again, I'll show you that one. And then again, I'll have photographs of these online uh, on this thread when we get done. But that was a surprise to, to get a comment to us out of the blue regarding that particular that particular uh, badge. It was really special to come across. Uh, 2011. 2011, uh, it stands out in martial service history as one of the worst years for line of duty deaths. Uh, there were uh, a number of deputy U.S. marshals, special deputy U.S. marshals, uh, killed in the line of duty in a number of different places. Uh, there were uh, there were some changes that took place after uh, 2011 that still resonate today within the marshal service in how people respond to events and how the teams show up uh, for to serve warrants or how they work with uh, special deputies on their task forces. Uh, as part of that, uh, this particular case um, in 2011. Uh, John Brookman Perry, Deputy John Perry, this is the badge that he wore as a deputy. And we have that encased in loose sight. This is on loan to us from the uh, Marshal Service. And uh, that's, let me just read the description here. John Brookman. John Brickman Perry was a 26-year veteran of law enforcement, first serving 16 years as a probation officer, followed by 10 years as a deputy U.S. marshal. Married twice, he had three children, Laura Perry, Sam Perry, and Brooke McClay. While working in the East, Eastern District of Missouri, he was a team leader on a fugitive task force. The St. Louis police requested the assistance of the fugitive task force in arresting Carlos Bowles, a convicted felon, on new charges. As they moved to arrest Bowles, he opened fire, hitting Perry in the neck. Deputy U.S. Marshal Perry was rushed to surgery, but tragically died as a result of his injuries. Bowles was killed in the shootout as well. In addition to his children, Perry was survived by his mother, Pamela Roberts, his brother, Bartley Perry, and his sister, Meredith Neal. Uh, this one kind of hits home to me because I grew up just a little ways outside of St. Louis, and it's, one of, it's another one of those cases where somebody willingly was going into the line of duty. We have now uh, three different cases that I've listed out that go into three different areas of martial service responsibility. Uh, simply taking care of the court process, uh, transporting prisoners or being responsible for the security of the court, and then also going after fugitives. And so that's three different areas that the martial service are involved in. Uh, and then uh, we also have another part of that is the transportation of prisoners from one district to another district. Uh, materials related to Henry Burton Carlson, also known, his nickname was Bud. Uh, I'll read the uh, overview first. This is uh, June 20th, 1991. Deputy U.S. Marshal Henry Carlson and another deputy were tasked with the transportation of two federal prisoners from Michigan State Prison to Sandstone Federal Prison in Sandstone, Minnesota. 
While driving through Wisconsin, one of the two prisoners in the back seat managed to slip his hands out of his cuffs. Well, slip his uh, hands, which were cuffed in front of him. He threw a jacket over the head of the deputy in the passenger seat. At the same time, the other prisoner, John Luttrell, lunged forward, grabbed the pistol of the deputy who was driving, and fired several times. Carlson was hit once in the back. Luttrell managed to evade law enforcement for a few days, but was captured and returned to prison. Henry Carlson survived for almost six years after being shot, but died as a direct result of the bullet wound. And Carlson, uh, related to that day, we have a pair of his eyeglasses and the uh, clip on tie that he happened to be wearing that day. So the uh, materials, it's, it's just kind of one of those things to me as a museum professional, um, they say as much, materials like that say as much about somebody as the badge that they wore. Um, they get a chance to uh, come in and uh, they give, give us a chance to look into the lives of the individuals and it helps us tell a broader story. Uh, of course, everybody had a badge and a gun, but uh, with the more information that we have, the more materials related to the life of people, the more things that touch uh, how people uh, live their lives as well as how they worked, uh, that's as important in telling the stories. Because as, uh, as I've heard a couple of different people say, especially regarding today being National, Law Enfor National Peace Officers Memorial Day, uh, it's one of those things that it's not always how they did their job, but how they lived. And that's, in many cases, what the most important part of remembering people is. Um, so that was uh, Bud Carlson. Uh, another case I want to talk about, this is just a couple of years after Bud Carlson was shot. This is uh, August 1993, and it's uh, regarding the two posters that are sitting behind me. Anyone who has ever been around the marshal's office anywhere in the United States has probably seen these two posters or something similar. Uh, these posters are quite common in a lot of different places. Uh, and, these, and these two particular posters were hung in Kansas in a federal court building. That particular court building, there was an individual, and this one I don't have a high view uh, overview of the situation. I'll try and pull that out. But August 5th, 1993, uh, Gene Goldsby was a, assigned to the fourth floor of the courthouse. He was a special deputy U.S. Marshal as a court security officer. If you go to any federal court building today, you will probably see a number of men, usually older men, walking around. They'll have a uh, blue blazer on, white shirt, tie, and they'll have a lapel badge that says court security officer. Many of those individuals are prior law enforcement, uh, maybe prior service military. Uh, they are sworn in as special deputy uh, marshals, and they are known as court security officers. Their job is to help, essentially, secure the court. They support and assist the deputy U.S. marshals in doing their job of making sure that the court properties and the court process are all safe and secured, not just for those of us who might be going in to visit, but for the people involved in the court actions, the judge, the jury, uh, the, any lawyers involved in any action, uh, the people who are there as witnesses, the people who are there in attendance, as well as the people who are, if, if it's a criminal action, the accused, uh, simply because there are a number of cases where, uh, as I said, there's a storm going through, so you might hear some more thunder going through. Uh, so anyway, the uh, special deputies, the court security officers, uh, there's a number of folks uh, listed in the Hall of Honor who are court security officers. Uh, they died doing their job protecting uh, court uh, properties. Um, and because of his law enforcement experience, uh, he was appointed a special deputy U.S. Marshal and assigned as a court security officer. Uh, his duties enjoyed, involved the security in and around the Frank Carlson Federal Building in Topeka, Kansas. Uh, on August 5th, 1993, he was in his assigned position on the fourth floor of the courthouse. Jack Gary McKnight was scheduled to appear before a federal judge for a sentencing hearing. 
McKnight had been found guilty on drug charges and was facing 10 years in federal prison. He entered the courthouse wearing a two-piece gray suit under his coat. He carried two 9mm pistols, a 357 revolver, and several pipe bombs. As soon as he entered the elevator and went to the fourth floor, as the door opened, he stepped into the hallway and began opening fire. The first person he shot and killed was Gene Goldsby. He never had a chance to draw the weapon. The gunman then opened up on Terry Morrow. Also in the hallway, Morrow was struck in the arm, dropped to the floor, and played dead. McKnight walked to the office of the federal district court clerk, detonating three to four pipe bombs as he went. He threw one inside the clerk's office. Marshal service was called and advised the situation, and they called other law enforcement agencies for assistance. And regarding that point, quite often in larger federal court buildings, the marshal service may not be co-located with the court. They may be in a separate uh, building. Usually they are in the court building. Um, there are times when you have other federal buildings that they might be in one federal building and the court's in another, but there's a lot of different ways that they, that happens. Uh, eventually, uh, what happened was there was a standoff that lasted uh, later in the morning, and there was a bomb that exploded in the clerk's office. Uh, they, later that day, Lawman entered the clerk's office and found McKnight had been killed by, either, by one of the pipe bombs that he was carrying. It's not known whether he committed suicide or whether it went off accidentally. The two posters from behind me are from the courthouse in Topeka, Kansas. And I'm going to try to point to them. Uh, actually, I'll, go, I'll grab these and I'll try and show you where the damage was done because these were damaged by the pipe bombs when they went off. And here is one area where materials went into this particular poster. And this one received the brunt. This one received the brunt of the damage. You can see there's a large gouge through the poster, and you may not be able to make out too much, but it was peppered by fragments all over all over the poster itself. And so I'll try to have some better pictures of these here in a bit uh, once we get done with the video. But uh, these are some very special pieces to help show. They show the work that's done by Marshal Service, and they show the work that's done uh, across the uh, ac across the range of the workers. Uh, today, I've talked about U.S. Marshals, I've talked about Deputy U.S. Marshals, and I've talked about uh, court security officers. This is just a wide variety of the people we uh, are talking about, and the people we try to recognize for the work that they do. I know that uh, in the past. Um, we've talked about a couple of different other subjects uh, we had uh, in, during um, during April was the April 15th, a month ago today, was the anniversary of the Going Snake incident, or we refer to regularly as the tragedy at Going Snake. Uh, that to, to, to this point was still the deadliest day in U.S. Marshals history. Uh, eight people trying to perform a Marshals mission uh, were killed in the line of duty that day. Uh, beyond that, uh, we have three people in our Hall of Honor uh, tied to 9-11 uh, and the work that was being done on either the pile or in the sorting facilities afterwards. And we already know that there is, uh, unofficially, there's a fourth person that we will likely be recognizing over the next year. Uh, and I know that there are others who are Marshall Service employees and former employees who are still suffering the effects from 9-11. Uh, today, as we are going through uh, coronavirus COVID-19, uh, we already know that there are law enforcement officers all across the country who are losing their lives simply for doing their jobs. Uh, there are several people, uh, court security officers and deputy U.S. marshals, who have been infected with coronavirus and COVID-19, and uh, so we're looking for we're looking at the future where we will be recognizing more and more of these folks, unfortunately, uh, as they, uh, as determinations are made as to whether or not uh, they contracted coronavirus as part of their work duties or if it was some other cause. Uh, however, uh, with that, um, we have other things back in the collection here that we could talk about. 
uh, regarding a few other different folks. Uh, however, uh, right now I would like to uh, give everybody a few minutes to ask any questions that you might have. Um, and while you are, if anybody has any questions, I would love to hear them. Um, there are other stories that we can talk about and I'm looking back right now just to see if there are any other comments other people have made or any questions people had at any particular point. And I am not seeing anything. Uh, but we would be more than happy to answer any questions. Uh, one thing that I will comment on uh, really easily is uh, if you go to the Marshal Service Club page and you see that there's a particular number of deputies or U.S. Marshals people uh, who have died in the line of service uh, on their wall, their official listing is about 100 people less than, or 100 people fewer than what we have. Uh, we have more simply because we include uh, two different categories that the Marshal Service, by their by their nature and by their some different legal agreements that they have, they cannot accept some of the names. Uh, part of these are Special Deputy U.S. Marshals, uh, city, county, state, federal law enforcement officers working on task forces, for example. Uh, we can recognize those in our capacity as the Marshals Museum. We're very proud to be able to do that. Uh, they cannot, and I know that there are people within the martial service who wish they could, but there are agreements in place uh, that prevent them from doing that. The other thing that we can cover that the martial service doesn't is we have a almost, uh, I think we're now uh, with today, uh, today's recognition at the martial service, I think we're about 90 or so ahead of them on, or actually I guess that'd be about 80 or so ahead of them that are uh, essentially people who we believe are line of duty deaths, legitimate line of duty deaths. Um, the Marshal Service has received the research that has been presented to them and they're slowly going through that list. They're going through it as quickly as they can, but everybody has other jobs that we have to do. And they're going to be trying to get that list uh, laid down and every year uh, they'll be able to add a few more names off that list. Uh, this year I believe they added uh, eight or nine names off of that list. Last year they added six or seven. So uh, another few more years and we'll hopefully be done uh, with that list. Other than that, uh, I very definitely hope that it is a long time before we have to add another name to the wall uh, for any sort of active duty uh, situation. But uh, I know that eventually, eventual uh, issues are gonna take place and we're gonna have to add those names. Uh, very definitely though, please uh, keep law enforcement in your thoughts today. Please uh, keep their families in your thoughts today. Uh, it's a hard life and a hard job and a lot of people are not uh, able to uh, get the recognition that they deserve. Um, take a look at the uh, link that we have for our YouTube channel. We just added again uh, a number of messages from uh, a variety of individuals, mostly related to Marshall Service, that gives thoughts about t the importance of today and the importance of remembering those people who have gone before us. Uh, with that, if nobody has any questions, I would uh, like to thank everybody who stopped in to take a look and visit with us. Uh, continue, uh, good luck and stay safe. Uh, take care of yourself. Uh, I know that everybody in the country is starting to loosen up a bit, but continue to social distance where you can. I know that uh, we all need to be careful and the best people we can protect are the other people around us. So uh, by all means, if you have any questions at all, we do keep track of the comments on our Facebook page. So uh, if you have any questions that you think about later on, uh, we would love to hear from you and we would love to uh, keep in contact. So thank you very much and you guys have a good day. Bye-bye.